I'm looking for, I guess I already am mic'd, aren't I? Okay. I'm mic'd. Okay. I'm Bob, but I'm mic'd. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, in information development world event. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. I've uh, come to about the last five or six Scott and Val conferences, and this is one that is really uh, chock full of really interesting stuff. Uh, my talk today is, is going to be a little different. Uh, you see that I said 30 plus years and 30 minutes. Uh, Scott asked me to try to, I mean, one of the, the privileges of living a long time is you get to look back with pious sanctimonious as about the history of a field. And I'm going to talk about 30 years of intelligent content. I've been working on it long before it was called that. And uh, even though I've talked about this work many times, I've never had the opportunity to talk about it all at once in a way that lets you reflect on, on what really went on. And it's been really enlightening to do that. Uh, I'm going to talk about essentially different phases of my uh, professional life. I spent about 10 years in big company R&D, mostly at Bell Labs. I then uh, transitioned by going through a consulting firm uh, to, to become a Silicon Valley uh, founder or co-founder of a number of startups in the 1990s in intelligent content areas. I then I retired uh, about 2002 to be a Berkeley professor for one semester, and I'm now in my 13th year at Berkeley. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to review these different phases of the intelligent content work I've done. And what has struck me at the end was that I've been doing the same thing all along, and I'm still doing it. Uh, and in some sense, as they say en français, ça plus à ces chances, blah, 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 whatever it is, uh, things are still the same. Yeah, I know it. I'm just, just mumbling for fun. Uh, so the, the basic idea is that the themes that I'm going to talk about are this have basically changed, but they haven't changed. That's really the interesting part of, of this retrospective. Um, when you first hear the word intelligent content, which we've all been talking about, you think, well, what would the alternative be? Stupid content? Dumb content? And it really is kind of a funny term. I actually started using the word about 1990 called information IQ. Uh, the idea being that, that information formats could be distinguished by how much they were explicit about representing content and how much they separated content from presentation. And these two dimensions of was how I characterized the smartness of the format. But people would say, oh, is that like information literacy? And I said, no, it's not about the people, it's about the format. So I think the intelligent content is actually a better word, but, but I have too many slides that say information IQ, so I have to keep using them. I actually found, in the course of doing this, this presentation, I found an old uh, hard drive, a Western digital hard drive that looked about this big, about 50 megabytes. And I, that was a huge disk drive back about 2000 or 1999. Probably paid $800 for it or something. I mean, and I found on it a bunch of presentations from the early and mid-90s. And I actually have slides from some of these that are pretty funny in retrospect. They probably were funny then, but I didn't know it. But they're, they're certainly funny in retrospect. So let me begin with uh, the phase of my uh, looking back at intelligent content in publication, which is where I started. I started at Bell Laboratories about 35 years ago uh, in an uh, research, applied research unit of, of a network systems organization. And we had the problem of how do you deliver documentation for big software systems? And we finally decided that we should just pretend that documents were software. And so we essentially started doing configuration management and version control and using all the machinery of software development to uh, do document development and management. So essentially we invented document management, things like um, when the, if you change the document during the daytime, it would wake up at midnight and index the collection again. Or uh, we'd pre-format any document because we had to take good advantage of that 1200 baud dial-up line that you could use to download your documents. So by pre-formatting documents, we saved an enormous amount of computing time uh, when people tried to retrieve documents. And even though uh, that was pretty slow, I mean, it's about, a, I don't know, a thousand times slower than we have it today or something, or maybe more than that, people really liked that experience of being able to go to a, a hand-tailed terminal, which we were also then at the same time, uh, and download information about, about how different maintenance systems work. And when I read this last sentence here, it says, documents are, are modular with properties to make them easier to create, use, and maintain. I thought, I could have written that yesterday. And I wrote it in 1981. So we were doing some interesting stuff 35 years ago. 
Um, a few years later, after Bell System broke up, I went off to a small boutique firm, what we'd call a UX consulting firm, and started working on a project to develop what was essentially the first CD-ROM encyclopedia. And um, we developed in that project a lot of concepts and methods for turning books into ebooks that I'm still using today in my ebook research about what is a, what is a module and, and how many links should it have coming in and out and how do you know whether you've done an effective job of converting the book or not. Um, we didn't actually make this thing all the way to production. We sort of got stuck at prototype stage, but here's this slide from about 1990 or so that says, we took this encyclopedia entry and we deconstructed it into different parts. It's content part, it's structure part, it's presentation part, because we wanted to be able to provide customized experiences for readers who could show, selectively show, different parts of the encyclopedia entry by filtering on these content tags. At the same time, people managed to do this with another project in the Oxford English Dictionary project, um, where they looked at what a dictionary entry was. And the OED is an amazing technical document because it is probably the most complicated data model you can imagine. Uh, and yet, the entries themselves range from three words, like many entries in the dictionary say, glurp, see, bows, or something. So they're three words long, the entry. Other entries are 22,000 words long, uh, like the definition of the word set, something like that. And so you have, this is the data model for the complete entry. Um, Obviously, there's a great deal of optionality here because the three-word entry wouldn't fit this very well if it was all required. Um, but they managed with this kind of really intelligent data modeling of the dictionary to build an a, a encyclopedia prototype that look, could do things like this and say, here you see at the bottom the kind of high school dictionary that has the definition and a couple of the word and a couple of definitions. Then you have this scholar's dictionary that has all the codes and all the the etymology and so on, and you could choose which of those, those views of the dictionary you wanted. That was just, it was just, when I saw this actually working, it was just, knew that's what I'd wanted to do, and I just wasn't smart enough to get there. But this is, this is sort of the first thing I ever saw about 1987 or 88 that had this idea that intelligent content, rich markup, could enable you to do incredible things with interactions and navigation. This idea of highly granular content was the key to highly nuanced interaction. Now, I was amused by the last speakers talking about the history of HTML because I actually hated HTML. And when anyone old enough to remember the days of like 19, you know, 88, 89, we were doing HTML-based tech doc, HTML-based CD-ROM encyclopedias. When the web came along, I was livid. I was struck by, how could they think of something so stupid, such a step backwards? And I, used to, I fought with Tim Berners-Lee. In fact, I was on the committee that rejected his paper for the ACM Hypertext Conference in 1991 when we said, Tim, this is stupid. We're doing n-way links with multimedia and typed links, and you're doing this one-way untyped text thing. And he goes, can I please demo it? We said, fine, you can demo it, but your paper's rejected. Now, three years later, I had to beg him to be our keynote speaker. But uh, Tim and I got over that, and, uh, but still, and I still fought it because I knew intellectually we needed smarter content. So it, you can look it up and blush go poison or panacea. There's a panel I organized at a conference and I said the HTML lovers and the HTML haters got together and fought it out. Uh, some of you know Elliot Kimber, that fellow did it. he used to work for me. He was one of the HTML haters. He said, this is too brain dead stupid. You can hear Elliot saying that if you know Elliot. Um, and so I found myself trying to explain why HTML was a bad idea. Um, because it wasn't smart enough. Even though the web's a revolutionary idea, you know, it, it could have been different. And the whole semantic web movement shows that it was like the horse got out of the barn and we had to, you know, after the, you know, we tried to close the barn door too late. But it was, we traded expressive power for ease of use. Uh, my grandmother could make web pages and she could never use XML. Um, but it was still this real tension. I, mean, I found this slider trying to show the difference between XML and HTML, that HTML is what your eyes could use, but only your eyes and not very much more, whereas XML was what your brain could use or your computer could use. And this is, this is I love this little cloud clip art and the big fat desktop computer. Um, but we were already using the cloud metaphor in 1990. That's pretty cool to see that. But this is too sophisticated, too abstract for a lot of people. So I had another metaphor at the time. I called it the lobbies and cubicles metaphor, and I said, now, you all have 
fancy company offices, you know, big companies, and that lobby has the plush carpeting and the plush sofas, the nice artwork on the wall. Here you see this little mobile hanging on the wall here. And, but that's not where the work gets done. In fact, no work gets done in the lobby. That's where people waste time. They're unproductive in the lobby, waiting to do work. So in the cubicles, that's where the work gets done. But those are simple, standard, you know, not a lot of ornamentation. So I showed this picture and said, look, the lobby's where the HTML goes. Handcrafted, artistic, flash, fun to interact with, no work gets done there. You want to transact, you want to have catalogs, you want to have content, that's in the cubicles. Just the facts, you know, text intensive, reuse from your databases, you know, that's where the, the, the work gets done. And people say, oh, I get it, that's where the work gets done. You need this smart stuff in the back, and the front could be you know, fun, but the back has to be work. Well, the emergence of the web um, killed my publishing startup. We were doing single source HTML publishing. In fact, my company in, in the early 90s helped Silicon Graphics, Sybase, Borland, Tandem, Hitachi, Novellus, half the companies in this room were clients of mine. Cisco was a client of mine, helping them move their 10,000 pages of technical publications to CDs. We knew a lot about CDs. Um, and the web came along, we said, oh, that's just another output format, another, another transform from that HTML database. And what happened was all the executives in those companies said, great, we, can, we have HTML, we can fire our writers and have engineers make web pages. Some of you might have been collateral damage during that period. Um, we said, no, no, that's not the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to solve the problem of intelligent content so you can do things with your documents like different views and reassemble them in different kinds of documents. They go, we can save money by having engineers write, make web pages. Now, they can't write English, they can't write coherent sentences, but that's a different problem. Okay? So I watched my, my company blow up and I said, well, you know, uh, I can survive that transition if I take people who know how to do HTML and XML data modeling and do B2B instead of publishing. So we turned the company into a B2B company because it was clear to me that business models were basically document exchanges. We could look at a, a big enterprise company like this with its different kinds of uh, indirect and explicit and, and direct procurement and then as distribution of various things to customers in different markets and say, this is choreographed by document exchanges. I send you a catalog, you send me an order. I send you an invoice, you send me a payment, a shipping notice and so on. We're doing document exchange choreography. And here's another slide from 20 years ago with that kind of bad PowerPoint clip art and stuff. Um, Showing the drop shipping business model, trying to explain this to people, saying, look, when you go to, to a website, they don't actually own the stuff. They have a catalog online. There's a warehouse someplace and a delivery service, and essentially they send messages to each other to make that business model happen. It's choreography through the document exchange. Now, um, the key, though, is that They've got to be glued together somehow. So those documents are glued together by overlapping content. So the item in the catalog that you ordered becomes the thing that gets shipped, the thing, that, the thing that, that you pay for, and so on. So you have to have some glue. And the key was, is your glue smart enough to do that well? A lot of people were doing EDI at the, in, the, in that time, electronic data interchange. And this, is a, this is a snapshot of an EDI document. It's not stupid glue, but it's not smart glue. Because there is some semantic markup in there. You see things like DTM and, and uh, QTY and things like that, sort of quantity, date, and so on. But it doesn't have good markup. There's no way to grab things as, as pieces and so on. So we needed smarter glue. And that's where, again, oh, we can use HTML as the glue. I said, HTML is too stupid to be the glue. You need smart glue. And so my company essentially invented B2B XML. We built the first XML marketplace platform. We built the first B2B vocabulary for XML. That's why my BMW says B2B XML on the back of it. At least it did for a long time. That's what made B2B happen, XML, smart content. Because again, those businesses are glued together by this overlapping content. So a really good idea there is that you want to have some kind of intelligent content that can be reassembled to make those different documents so that you can easily find the glue pieces as you move from document to document in that business process. 
And this is what's called the common business language. It later evolved to be universal business language, which was the most widely used B2B XML markup language for that kind of stuff. Another good idea at the time about intelligent content was it wasn't enough to have smart pieces. You also had to have smart ways to assemble those pieces. So we invented essentially standard document architecture. So you could say, here is how those, those pieces that go into, say, a purchase order can be extended to build a industry-specific purchase order and even a company-specific one. So then when you had cross-company uh, business to business, you could unwrap those extensions and find the things you could both understand. Now, earlier I showed you a slide trying to explain to, to an executive about why he wanted XML in the cubicles and HTML in the lobby. This is the picture trying to show why you wanted to make the conversion to XML from EDI. You know, I'd say, look, there is clearly a cost to be paid at the left side of this chart uh, because if it's already working now, you can just leave it there and it'll work for a long time in EDI. But if you cross over by adopting XML or especially a standard XML, you, know from, you might know from geometry that that area to the right of that crossover is infinite. So once you cross over, you win big time forever. And they go, okay, I said, look, the area to the right of the crossover is infinite. It goes out forever. And so once you cut over to, to XML or to a smart XML intelligent content, you win forever. And so that, that was my business case for XML and two slides. It's often easier to, to do a simpler business case, a graphical business case, than a long spreadsheet. Why are we not? Oh, okay. So those are the first two phases of my intelligent content work in publishing and B2B, but it turns out that I was doing the same thing in both places. I realized after I looked back at it that, that you know, every business does both publishing and transactions. And their publishing and transactional processes are very interconnected lots of times. So you see that like a, a, a requirements document, RFI, RFQ, a, trans, a narrative kind of document will kind of morph into the order and the invoice, which then get morphed back into these tech docs that support the things that were bought and delivered. Um, in fact, some of those documents are contained at the same time, that kind of publishing and transactional content. Like here you see a catalog. And, there's a database, and then there's a novel in the same document. And even for documents like Moby Dick, which is clearly almost the, the, uh, the typical thing you would publish, uh, you can make it more transaction-like if you make decisions about what to mark up and sort of mix content models. And this is essentially what's been done by some people to do like digital humanities work, where they want to do a lot of, of extraction of entities and things like that to do sophisticated analysis of this. Now, I love Moby Dick because, of course, the first line of Moby Dick is call me XML. All right. Now, the point here is that there's no clear line between documents and data, between sort of narrative and transactional content, but between publishing and transactions. But you need to think of them as a continuum from narrative to, trans to transactional content, which implies that you shouldn't try to do intelligent content differently if you're doing publishing or doing transactions. You need to have a unified methodology for looking at it as a system, where you say, I want to analyze the problem I have, find design patterns for either narrative or, or, or publishing processes, try to extract what I have already now and try to make it better so I can reassemble it according to standards and so on. And this methodology I call document engineering. Um, and, and these, these steps that are common across transactional and narrative processes are identifying the document components, making them good or smart components or intelligent components, organizing them in ways they can be reused, and having a document architecture where you can assemble them and reuse them in intelligent ways and business processes. Many of you own this book because Scott Abel has relentlessly promoted this book for a decade. If you don't, it's still available in print. Um, so like I said, in 2002, I retired from Silicon Valley to become a Berkeley professor, and I got interested in the design of information-intensive uh, uh, services, especially in the design of complex service systems where intelligent content could make a difference. We're talking about things like, like uh, complex service encounters where you have a mixture of face-to-face -face and, and self-service transactions, often multi-channel where you have a mixture of physical and online environments, uh, and so on. So I tried to apply my ideas of intelligent content 
that are used in publishing a business to this new kind of uh, personalization of smart services uh, domain. I started with the idea that um, in many domains, the service that a customer wants have overlapping content models for the simple reason that you want to do the services in the same place at the same time. So if I want to uh, go to Toronto on a business trip, I'm going to need a flight, a hotel, a restaurant, and maybe something to do after my meeting is over. So I need to go to a flight side, a hotel side, a restaurant side, and you know, an entertainment side. But uh, those service providers had historically had their own sites for transacting with me. And yet, we could analyze it that they had, so, so they had their own sites. So for example, if you look at, at a hotel, you see that you have to tell it uh, what kind of hotel you want, location, time, quality of service, and kind of amenities, and so on. Um, even though um, those semantics, in many ways, are shared with the, the flight and the restaurant and so on, the quality of service. If I'm going and flying first class, I'm going to stay at a nice hotel. They have, obviously, I don't want to go to a fancy restaurant. They're going to have some commonalities across those service uh, content models. So um, we started trying to find ways to automatically combine uh, those overlapping content models and using the overlapping pieces as the glue, like we did with the business-to-business -business, uh, problem called these service compositions where they were put together by the overlapping bits of, of content. And you could then, from that, generate a unified user customer experience by only asking once for the things that overlapped. Okay? So here you see my kind of trip planner. Uh, it says that, that by, I look at my historical transactions with these providers. I look at their data models, and then I can kind of unify those content models and say, oh, Bob's start is always San Francisco. That's the default, SFO. He likes to fly first class, get there nonstop, and get there before dinner. And he likes to say, nice hotel that he can walk to nice restaurants from. That's more or less my trip schema that cuts across those number of different content models. So we can build that. And then, because we have that smart content, we have got that kind of, each of the providers knows how to talk to me intelligently, and they know my experience, and they've marked it my experience intelligently to create a good user model. I can then respond very effectively, because I can default or predict a great a number of my uh, information elements in this transaction. Um, so I can basically get a proposal back from this unified service, that says, in this case, reading from the bottom up, it says, OK, we know you like Italian restaurants, and you've gone to all one restaurant a lot in Toronto, but this other one place, is, it's the same kind of thing. Maybe you want to try that for now, give you an alternative. Um, we know you like to get a black car from the airport, and here's your confirmation. You can turn it down, but here's the one we've made for you already. And here's your hotel. We know you always stay at the Intercontinental, so that's your hotel. So it's basically an extremely tight customer experience, high quality. All the things are unified across the quality of service levels and so on. And it's made possible by intelligent content. Okay, now the final area in which I have adopted this notion of intelligent content is my latest project. It's really the combination of the first and last ones about, about content, uh, intelligent content for publishing and intelligent content for service personalization. Uh, it's a textbook that I've uh, done at Berkeley in the last couple of years, actually last eight years, but the book's been out about two or three years. Uh, about a textbook that uh, I think emphasize, em, em, embodies some of these ideas of intelligent content and personalization. The book is called The Discipline of Organizing. I will only briefly talk about that because really that's the story that is from some time at the time. I really want to talk about the way in which intelligent content architecture of this book um, developed and how it enables customization and personalization of the user experience. The book was published in 2013, as a printed book and as an ebook format, using a single source publishing system from O'Reilly called Atlas. Um, we did second and third editions in the last two years. They're enhanced. Um, uh, and why is it jumping ahead on me? OK. Um, it was named an Information Science Book of the Year last year, and it's in use in 70 countries in 20, 70 courses in 25 countries. So the, we used O'Reilly's Atlas, which is basically a doc book under the hood, single source repository system. Why is it doing this? OK. Uh, it's got Git version control. It has these built-in transforms for the formats you want to produce. But let me talk about this one of organizing for one slide. 
Uh, the book is based on the sim simple, powerful idea that says, even if you're organizing lots of different things, libraries, museums, zoos, vineyards, your personal document collection, your institutional document collection, your people, you're creating an organizing system, which is an intelligently, intentionally arranged collection of resources and some set of interactions. So even though, even though there's obviously a lot of differences in what we're organizing, at some level of abstraction, they're all the same. So um, the challenge that, 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 a, that a transdisciplinary book gives you is that you want it to be obviously mandate a book by many authors because no, no one knows all those disciplines that have come together for those different kinds of organizing domains. But that makes the book very broad, uh, which is what you want. But if it's deep enough to be credible in each of those disciplines, it's going to be very, very big. How do you manage the sort of breadth and depth at the same time of a book like this, which is, wants to be a textbook that can be used on lots of overlapping fields that have organizing at their core? So what we did was we said, is there a way to emphasize that transdisciplinary core of this book while still preserving this disciplinary enhancement as supplemental content? So we factored the book into a set of layers with the content that's transdisciplinary at the core, and then these other layers essentially extracting paragraphs and, and notes that are tagged by discipline. So we produced a book in 2014 that looked like this, where you had essentially a third of the content was in disciplinary specific notes or sidebars and, or paragraphs. And that makes the depth into a choice rather than a distraction or a confusion. The reader can presumably decide whether the supplemental content is relevant and explore the book in the way they want from their disciplinary perspective. Now that depends on how easily that the user can tell what's going on with the book and the mechanisms for following the supplemental content. And those are both interesting research questions which we spend a lot of time on. So, if the book design lets readers figure out what's going on, they can presumably do that. But there's a lot of ways to do supplemental content. You could have you know, footnotes or endnotes or pop-ups or sidebars, and, and they're not equally usable by readers. Um, and in addition, there's, there's a lot of the reader's own point of view which shapes whether they want to make use of those mechanisms. So, um, we uh, have tried a number of different things. One thing we've tried is we've tried to tag the notes and paragraphs by discipline. So here you see on this part of the ebook, uh, a, the left circle says 36 law, which means it's a legal footnote about legal perspective on this content. And then the MUS little lozenge says this paragraph is about museum specific content, but it's still pretty accessible to most people. So we'll leave it there instead of burying it in a footnote. We tried pop-up notes. Uh, which people found uh, better than hypertext links, but uh, most ebook readers um, don't do very well with embedded links and pop ups, and so we couldn't use that. Uh, so we finally have gone to a model that, that believes in trans inline transclusion, where you have, uh, if you select the, the footnote, it opens up the book and puts the text in the middle of the text and then close it up when you go away. Readers like that. The problem is this takes a lot of JavaScript and um, most of uh, the ebook platforms are kind of not very good at that. In fact, it's sort of a puzzle to me that, that um, browsers finally got smarter to do useful things in the last couple of years, uh, where we could have JavaScript and CSS and a lot of good things like that to make enhanced experiences. So when you have an ebook plugin, we disable JavaScript and CSS to make the experience controllable and stupid. Not very smart. Okay. So um, what I really wanted to do was to publish, publish any book you would want. So if you have 11 disciplines in this book, 11 things taken end at a time. Remember that from my math? 2,048 possibilities of books you could have if you said any combination of disciplines that you want to read about. Now, again, this, for example, memory, library science, people might want to learn this configuration of museums, archives, and library science. It's kind of a canonical pairing called memory institutions. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of those nice possibilities, and so how many can you publish? Well, it turns out that um, even that's not right because it assumes that even within the same classroom or course, people will have homogeneity in their, in their perspectives, and that's not what most people are coming from. They're coming to my school at Berkeley from lots of different majors. They want to have their own book. What we really want is to publish any book, 
How about we publish any book anybody wants out of the 2048 possibilities? They go to your publisher and they say, 2048 books, and they said, fat chance, Bob. Okay? Publishers talk a lot about customization, but they typically mean print and a couple of ebook formats. They don't mean 2048, almost the same edition of a book. So I convinced my publisher to publish two, the endpoints, the one called the core concept edition, which has no disciplinary specific content, and one called the professional one that has everything. So it's like zero in 2048 is what it is. And that's not really uh, what I wanted, but that's what they let me do. So what I want is to be able to have dynamic, reader-controlled publishing, what I'm calling poly polyvalent books, meaning can we convert the discipline tags on the XML to class attributes that we can then use JavaScript in the reader to selectively exclude and exclude, include, and have it visualize it, interact with the visualization, and yeah. And how many of those platforms run JavaScript? One out of the 17 I could possibly use. So we're kind of in the, we can make this run in my laboratory. It doesn't run in the real world. My publisher says, I want to ship a book which is experimental. People think, will think it's defective. I said, it's experimental. No, that means defective to most people. So what we're doing now is we're visualizing the book. So you can, the book has in the, in the, in the first chapter, this, so this is what the book looks like. 20% of it is discipline specific, and here's the distribution across those disciplines. Different chapters are different. So this is the chapter on resource description and metadata. It's clearly a library science chapter compared to most chapters and business. How much are you willing to tag? Basically kind of considerations. Um, that's, what we, that's what we're doing now. That's very unsettling. I'm willing to make, deliver this dynamic book and we're getting close, but I gotta fix publishing first. Um, but where we are now is we can use this notion of a transdisciplinary book with, with uh, discipline specific tagging um, and other tagging like, like reading level. We're doing a lot of experimental tagging on reading level and rhetorical intent. Is this an explanation or an example or a contrast? And way too hard to use that in a real book yet. But we have what we call the mother of all books with 2048 books lying there latent in that little EPUB bundle. And I think that with the appropriate visualization and user interface controls and the appropriate platform, we'll be able to have reader personalized books. But that's not where I want to stop. Because if I can do this, I should be able to let any instructor who's using this book with an XML editor in their hand add their own content, customize their own build instruction, and build their locally customized book. So, that I, so they have the Texas Library School version and the Pitt iSchool version and the Rutgers version and the Michigan version and the Berkeley version, which might be slightly different because we've added our own content locally. That's called the Network Book. And so we can deploy any particular fixed, con fixed, fixed configuration of content. We can let people publish their local content in this repository. And then we can discover that if you let me discover it, and I can include it into my book at, at Berkeley. I can look at being Berkeley and have my students find Texas content, maybe start doing Texas collaborative annotation of the books, have a shared annotation space. Because in some sense, my notes are just preemptive annotation by professors as opposed to actual annotation by users. And that should be one long tail there that somehow fits into this uh, extensible network textbook model. But we're not done. So I think that if we have this kind of smarts under the hood in the content, and I know my students, I know the user model of the student at Berkeley, if only Berkeley would let me track them, which they won't yet. They're really bad about letting professors know what students actually read. Imagine coming to class and saying, you know, John, I know you didn't read the book, the, the syllabus this week. I saw your data about which pages you read in my textbook. That would, I'd be, that'd never happen. But if we could log, in principle, we could take that and say, you know what? Or I can embed quizzes in my book, which I'm doing, and assess comprehension and then dynamically adapt the book to the reader's needs, sort of pruning and growing that, that text space by adding things, by subtracting things, by changing the reading level of a paragraph where they're having trouble and so on. I know we can get there. That's probably 2018's book. Okay. Um, but when I look back at all this, these five phases of 
publishing of Bell Labs and CD-ROM encyclopedias and business to business and smart services and now smart books, e-books, I've come around the block, all right? I mean, essentially, we're still doing the same things as we did before. We still have the same idea that intelligent content gives you more flexible user experience. It gives you more flexible automation of the, of the publishing process, more flexible automation of business processes that involve document exchanges. But I think the big idea that's emerging now for me is that intelligent content has great value at design time, but it has even bigger value if you can apply it at runtime. That's because that's where you can get the, the context-sensitive personalization, which I think is really going to be the future of, of intelligent content. So I actually did it in 30 minutes almost, um, which is 35 years and 30 minutes. Um, well, 35 years and 35 minutes, and who's counting? Um, and I really want to thank the thousand people who've been involved in this project, students, collaborators, uh, employees, everyone I learned from, failed with, and succeeded with to get here. Thanks very much.